Tennessee. I think she went to Brother Cletus Benfield's church last Sunday, I think. Anyway, um, all right. Um, I don't have any reports for you on the folks in Wichita other than, I mean, no late reports like today or yesterday. Mm. I know they were worried about Brother Mackey and Brother Paul Golden. Their next step was going to be the ventilator. I don't know if they went on it or not. We sure need to keep Sister Sherry Riley in our prayers. She is, in fact, the doctors, I think, talked to her husband yesterday and gave her no hope for, you know, making it. So we sure need to pray. Her, pray. She's on the ventilator, but she's not responding to anything, and her all her numbers are bad. And talked to Brother Wright. He, he confirmed that. Anyway, uh, but the Houston people are about to get over it, and that she's the only one in the hospital. So that out of 54 people that they had to have coronavirus, that's pretty amazing. The Wichita Church had 21 cases, and and um, um, and they've got Brother Mackey, Brother 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 Bloom. Brother Paul Golden. I think Brother Brother Larry Bryant, he was wanting to go home. I don't know if he went home or not, but uh, he was doing pretty good after they gave him a plasma transfusion. So, and then Brother Brother Daniels. Anybody got a report on Brother Daniels? I tried to call him, but I hadn't raised him, but. He was staying in the hospital to have some more tests done on his heart. He was seemingly doing pretty good when I talked to him, but is he home? He's, he's home, okay. So he may be, who knows, he may make it today. Brother Wallace, we need to keep praying for Brother Wallace. They've got him on a new medication, We're trying to get him stabilized and, and all. He's wanting to get back in church. So, a lot going on, isn't there? Brother Chad Neptune and his wife had a head-on collision yesterday and broke his arm and banged him up a little bit. I think she's okay. She was, I heard she was covered in glass, but, but, I, but I also heard that she was okay afterwards. That it, it really did. She didn't really have that much. Yeah, they sent them both home. They're going to be all right, but it's just kind of a, alarming thing thank God they weren't hurt any more than they were uh, have we got any Bible uh, questions this morning smart group smart group <laughs> Thirty, sixty, and a hundred fold. Okay. Did I go through it once? Yeah, you have, but I'm not going to make sure I got it. <clears throat> um, well, it's in, in Matthew 13. And it's also on Mark 4. It's in 13, 23 of Matthew and 4, 8 of Mark. We'll read them both just to compare. Um, okay, this is the parable of the sower, of course. I like... Uh, the book of Matthew, uh, which, by the way, we might mention something else in here. That, but it's starting in the, uh, 
Let's start in the 18th verse. Is that what I said? I probably said the 23rd verse, but that's where it ends. But it starts in the 18th, the parable of the sower. It says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catches the way that which was sown in his heart. This is he that receiveth seed, seed by the wayside. Uh, maybe we ought to just back up and read, read his uh, parable first before he starts explaining. Um, he's talking about Isaiah uh, in the 14th verse. Fulfill the prophecy Isaiah saith by hearing. Uh, by hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and not perceive. For the people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are full of hear- full, uh, dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear, for verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you have not heard them. Okay. So hear the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. But he that receiveth seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, um, or immediately, right away, with joy receives it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. But when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by he's offended. He also that receiveth seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and deceiveth of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful because he receiveth seed unto good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it which also bear fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. So he's saying, um, uh, let's go to Mark also. It was in Mark 4. Eight is where he starts out. Let's back up on it too. Mark, the fourth chapter. Yeah. said, he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and set it in uh, the sea. The whole multitude was by the sea on the land, and he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And others fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Okay. Uh, Let's read on because this this, uh, rendering of, of what he did is a little bit more detailed. Others fell on a sea, and he said unto them, okay, verse 11, and he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, 
that seeing you may see and not perceive, and hearing you may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then shall you know all parables? That's one of the reasons that I say this is a very important parable because Jesus made the statement, if you don't understand this parable, how are you going to know any, any parable? So then he begins to explain, verse 14, The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they've heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. These are, are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, whom when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and no, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which sow, are sown on good ground such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred. Um, so starts out with the wayside soil. You know, the birds of the air come and get it. Well, that that happens. When pe people come in here, and they'll hear some of the word of God. And, um, but their, you know, their whole life is what would have to be considered as wayside soil. In other words, they're so hard-hearted that the word of God can't take any root there. And so... If they go somewhere and start talking to somebody about it, it's easy plucked up. In other words, people just, you know, because it's not took any root in them. There wasn't enough, um, there wasn't enough, even though there may have been an anointing when they heard it, it they didn't have, an, their heart wasn't tender enough to actually receive it. And so they immediately lose it. You know, they, they come in here, they hear something, but immediately it's gone you know they can't they can't contain it they can't absorb it at all but then uh those that are on stony ground but those people can also have the holy ghost right yeah yes yes they can have the holy ghost but at some point they may have got the holy ghost but but they can't you know uh they can be anywhere from an ungodly person to a person that's been saved to a person that, um, you know, like I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm thinking right now about uh, there was a, back when I owned a roofing company, there was an insurance adjuster, and that insurance adjuster, um, he got to know me. Cause we had several, several hailstorms, and we got to know each other, and he was a Christian, he was a Baptist guy, and, and he got to talking to me about the Holy Ghost. And I began to talk to him about it, but then he would go, uh, you know, he'd go talk to people in the Baptist, you know, people that he knew, his pastor and different ones, and they'd immediately pluck it out. You know, he would he was so confused about it, but he when he'd get to them... They'd pluck it up, you know. He it, and and he just didn't have enough depth in him that he would receive enough that he he could continue with a hunger about it. And uh, but he was this guy was you know I would I would really I could tell he was really interested, but then the next time I'd see him he'd he'd had already lost everything I'd told him about it because. Somebody plucked all that up. I was uh, I was talking to a little waitress uh, at the East End Cafe in East End, Missouri. There's a real nice cafe there called East End Cafe. Sister Smith and I eat there fairly often. Generally lunch. They just got good home cooking. And uh, 
this little waitress is always in there. She's a Christian, and she knows I'm a pastor. And so one day we were in there, and I told her, I said, come here, I'm going to tell you something. So she came over there, and so I, I said, I'm going to give you a little gold nugget. So I, I gave her a little uh, test, little word of the Lord. You know, I gave her something on the word of the Lord. I said, now, I want you to think about this. I want you to even pray about it. She said, I'm going to talk, I'm going to, talk to my pastor about it. I said, he'll pluck it up. <laughs> she said, what? I said, he'll pluck it up. I said, you don't, you, if you really want to get this, you don't want to talk to nobody among your group because they don't believe that. And so they're going to pluck up anything they don't believe. But what if it's the truth and you reject it and you let them pluck it up? And she said, I'll have to think about that. Well, he plucked it up, I promise you. Cause she, she won't talk no more about that next time I saw her. Anyway, um, so um, <clears throat> here, this stony ground, it says they receive the word of God right away They're, they with gladness. But they only endure from a time for when affliction and persecution arise for the word's sake. Immediately they're offended. Now Matthew said for, uh, for I think it said for affliction and, ter- and perse- uh, temptation. Um, <clears throat> that word translated aff- affliction, persecution, and temptation comes from the same Greek word. And... Um, but this this happens really to every one of us. I mean, when you start out serving God, when you first start serving God, you probably have more wayside soil than anything else. If you were raised in church, you may have, you know, you may have, your, your ground may be a little bit better than just wayside soil, but I can promise you it's pretty rocky. And, and rock, that, those rocks represent you know, it just represents the things of this world. You just got things in your life that hinder the word of God from really being able to take root. And then when persecution or from temptation, just when a trial comes your way, it's it's like what he's saying here in a parable, it's like the the sun rises up, you don't the, the seed didn't take enough root because it's so rocky. And so it comes up, but the, but the sun burns it up. In other words, whatever you go through in life, um, you're, going to be, you're going to be tried just naturally. It's not like God saying, okay, I'm going to put you through a bunch of trials to see how you do. It, God don't have to do that. There's just enough in nature that will try you because you're just like a little salmon swinging up, swimming upstream and everything's against you. You're going upstream, and everybody else is coming downstream, just about. And so it's like when you first start serving God, um, you know, it's it's pretty rough at first because all of your friends are ungodly people, or you wouldn't, or you'd be in church already. But because you're out of church, you're not going to make a bunch of friends with a bunch of church people. You're going to wind up, your friends are going to be out of church. And so when you first get saved, a person, they, then they don't have any friends, or the friends they've got are sort of in rejection mode against them. Because if they really got saved, they're going to want to talk to their friends about it, and that's going to put conviction on their friends, and their friends are going to shy away from that. And they're going to feel that rejection. And there's no hardly any worst emotional or anti-ego trip than rejection. Rejection's hard to take from anybody. And so, and that's that's a trial. That's a, that's temptation, because you, you you're tempted to want to just hide. You know, one of the things he says after this very next thing in verse 21 said. He said unto me, is your candle brought to put under a bushel or a bed? In other words, that's what you'll do is you'll hide, you know, you'll begin to hide what you got. You'll put, 
you'll cover your candle. You'll put your candle under a bushel. And what happens is, is those trials are finally, will they'll finally, you'll give up what you did receive. You may have received it at first, but you will give it up. Uh, I'll show you. Um, uh, let's read. Let's start in 21 and go on down right there. And he said unto them, as a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick. For there's nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret. Uh, but that it should come abroad. In other words, you keep ser- serving God, He's just going to keep He's just going to keep digging down into your life and keep showing you things that you need to you need to correct in your life and the things of God that you need to add to your life. And He said unto them, "Take heed what you hear, what with what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you, and unto you that hear shall more be given." For he that hath, to him shall be given, and he that hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he hath. Well, what you received as stony ground, when your trials and temptation comes, you'll give it up. And that's why you have to begin to, you've you got to be, begin to get your ground cleared out. That's why it takes God helping you to clean your life up, clean th- the things of this world, and get, you know, begin to shed things of this world so that you can have enough depth in your heart that you can receive the things of God. And, uh, but you will, if you stay in stony ground and you don't get anything, you don't, you don't get the things of this world out of your life, it'll finally you finally it'll pluck up all the word of God that you've received. And so it's a process that you just have to continue to receive to receive more things of God, you've got to get rid. You can't fill up a cup that's already full. You're gonna to have to empty that cup out. If you want to get God in it, you've got to get the world out and get more of God in. And and then when you do that, you start getting blessed of God. You know, and that God's blessings are uh, come from His favor. Uh, you know, He He will favor your life. He'll bless you, He'll give you blessings if you're obeying Him and you're receiving things from Him. To that, Him that hath shall be given. God will give you more. He'll give you more, not only of the Word of God, but it, He'll also begin to bless you. It's just like when you first start coming in, you got all these ungodly friends. You finally get shed of them, and you finally start making friends with the people of God. And you get over a lot of these temptations. You get a lot of the stony ground out of your life. And then you start having a lot easier walk. It's not as many trials, not as many uh, temptations, because those are stones. Those are, that's rocky ground. And so you get your ground cleaned up. Uh, there's another problem that will come along the way here in a little while because God's going to bless you. And he, uh, he's going to bless you so much that in a little while you're going to start having trouble with the cares of this life. You get your focus off of, you start focusing on all these blessings God's blessing you with you know and you'll start you'll start enjoying there's nothing wrong with enjoying things of this life as long as it doesn't get on your front burner and God gets on your back burner but when it gets on the front burner it's like thorns it's like weeds it chokes out the word of God chokes out the seed of God's word and we all go through that. Every single one of us. You may get your you may get your ground cleaned up, uh, but the but the cares of this life will choke things out to a point that you get you get imprisoned to things of this life, and you begin to lose. And even what you have received will be taken from you if you let enough uh, cares of this life get interfere with the things of God. 
and that's easy to do, especially in the in you know, especially uh, in our society. It's you know, there, there's several things goes on in our society that you have to work at it because one thing we're living in such a fast-paced society that you just you get so busy you know now we're so busy with our cell phones we 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 got information from the whole world i mean i don't you know yesterday 90 940,000 new people got coronavirus word in the United States. Nearly 100,000 people. Well, you just leave me alone. Tell me how many we got it in Little Rock. Where I, somewhere around where I live. Don't, don't burden me down with what's going on in the whole world, but we're getting it. You know, we got that information. I mean, bam. There's nothing wrong with this technological world we're living in if we can learn how to control it because it gets too, it's just too, uh, you know, it's, it just infiltrates our lives. And, and look, I, I'm not exempting more than you are. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's easy. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all saw the video about where... <laughs> That uh, Facebook, what's that guy's name, Mark, what's his name? Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. And then uh, uh, Twitter. Of course, I, I, I don't Twitter. I don't tweet. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can't hardly, I don't keep up with Facebook. You may be on my Facebook page, but if you are, it's whatever you're putting on there, it's what's on there, because you don't ever see me hardly post nothing. You know, it pops up and says, so-and-so's birthday. I say, happy birthday. <laughs> That's about what you get to see me say. But uh, they say that Facebook and Twitter, and now Instagram's added in, they say that those guys, if they want to, which they have done it, they've proved it, that they can target like, for an example, in 2016, they targeted the Democrats. And they, Facebook, sent messages to every Democrat, every registered Democrat there was, and encouraged them to go vote over and over and over. They did that, but they never did that to a Republican. They increased, the psychologist that did the study on it said they increased a minimum of 2.4% million votes up to the maximum of 10.8 million votes that they encouraged that they manipulated the 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 uh, election and they can do it and there is no way to trace them and there is no way to stop them and there is no accountability to it it's just amazing what's going on in this world and so, uh, you know, they can manipulate the election to, to a great extent, they're saying. <clears throat> you know, again, that, that's information that I don't have any idea whether or not it's absolute truth, but it sounds reasonable. It, I can see, you know, if you, just, if you just talk to one group of people and encourage them in one way, well, you're probably going to influence some of those people. And they, don't, they may not know that that's happening to just those people. See, that's the thing. Anyway, we're living in a great technological world, and we, we add all these things. You know, if you, if, you look at a, if you look at a washing machine online, when you start looking at your phone, advertisements of washing machines are going to pop up everywhere you get on that phone. You seen that? How do you think that happened? <laughs> it listens to you. Are y'all telling me that? Uh, 
Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Dear God. All right, so... Uh, so anyway, the cares of this life, I mean, it used, used to be, you know, God bless you with a new car and a nice home and nice, you know, did you ever notice how, you know, I mean, I lived for many, many years just with a bed and I decided to buy a good comfortable bed. Do you know how much a comfortable bed costs today? I mean, you can spend $10,000 on a bed. I mean, I used to sleep on a feather bed that when I, when I went to sleep, I didn't, I slept for it till I woke up. <laughs> I've slept on some pretty hard beds too, but I don't really believe there's a $10,000 bed that makes you sleep as that much better than, it's in your head, such a crow said. <laughs> I knew you'd side in with me on that, such a crow. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, anyway, so the cares of this life has greatly been enhanced over time. And so it, it gives us more to have to manage in our life and, and control in our life. Uh, it's just like our young people. I just feel for our young people because this is a tough world for them. It's a tough world for them to grow up in. There's far, far much more hindrances you know when I was a little boy I grew up on a 310 acre farm I mean when school was out I took the bus home I did the chores I worked in the garden I helped feed the cows and and, and brand the calves and feed the hogs and gather the eggs and went to the house and did my homework it was dark time I got in I did that every day we went to the you know, went to town once a month and bought groceries. That was, and we all, me and Dad and the other two boys, sat in the chair and waited on the barber to get to us, because that was part of going to the, going to to town. But you know, we. And then, I can remember when we got. I can remember the first TV I seen. It's black and white. I remember all them scrolling. You know, it scrolled with all them. I remember the first color one that came in. I remember when Mom and Papa Wilkett and Granny and Grandpa Smith got their first vehicles. They, they was horse and buggies. That makes me sound ancient, I know, but I just grew up in a poor town where it, people was ancient. <laughs> you know, I was fortunate enough that all that happened, but I didn't know nothing about what was going on outside of our little 310 acres except what I heard at school. And no, I didn't care that much about it. You know, I mean, some things was interesting, but, you know, our school burnt down when I was in the fourth grade, and we had every church in town was a different grade. My, I was in a Baptist church, and that was our school. And we went there for two years until we got our new school built. It's just, you know, but today it's a, it's a different story altogether, you know. Yeah, it is, and it's true. It's you know this world is just a new world, and I'm not saying we need to go back to the old world, but but I am saying we do need to learn how to manage it. It's yeah. So yeah, we need some of the old world. This girl said, and I agree with you, because did y'all know in school they don't even teach how to write in script anymore? They don't even teach how to write. It's everything you type it. You type it on your phone. You text it. You, you know. So they, they, you know, for long we're going to have kids that don't know how to write nothing. They can't write script for sure. You know. I mean, cursive is what it's called. Yeah. They, in fact, I don't even know if they know what cursive is. Sister Kayla, you know what cursive is? You're old enough to know. Well, probably. If we ask some of them little ones, I guarantee you they wouldn't know. Are they? Yes, they are. Good. Okay. Well, somebody will have to teach it to them because they're not teaching it in school anymore. Anyway, let's get back here to then there's good ground. 
And in the good ground, well, let's go back. I want to go back to just a moment. I'm going to go back to Matthew and see how he put that. Um, okay, so <clears throat> there, I'm sure back there in that, in that early church, I'll tell you how I put it, Sister uh, McGowan, probably what you heard me say was that I probably used Abraham's wells, you know, Esek, Setna, and Rehoboth. That, that in the uh, Protestant movement, we got about 30%. And in the Pentecostal movement, we've got about 60%. But it's going to take a fully restored church to give us 100% where we can receive 100% of what God is working on <clears throat> and you know you may have been able to back there in the early church um, you know there were there were Gentiles that came in there were there were Jews that came in late they that that uh, from from the Jewish sect of people that came in late and too late to make the bride probably uh, and so, uh, and then there were those in the body of Christ that were able to get 100%. Jesus broke that down into different segments of, of, of people. That was all good ground. Every bit of it was good ground. But they were only able to produce so much. I've heard ministers talk on it to the point where, uh, where they would put where a, a like the Apostle Paul wasn't married, so he was able to get a hundredfold because he didn't have a wife or family to worry about. He gave 100% of everything. Uh, I have some question on that because if, if it's all good ground and you, you, you produce 30-fold, you, in other words, you're producing a pure seed, but you're just not producing as much. As, uh, and, uh, you know, to, in other words, that's how that's looking at it. Or are you looking at it that you're only getting so much, uh, a third or two thirds nearly, to a hundred percent of all of what God has for you? Where does that hundred, that, in fact, I don't think there's an absolute answer to this because we don't have an absolute um, definition scripturally of what were his the depth of what he was saying was it just you you can realize that once you get good ground that it's going to take which you know another way of looking at it is is through the the same thing is uh Isaac sitting and Rhea both would be the same thing as is if you got everything through the gate, the type of the gate and the um, brazen altar, which is about all that pro Protestantism got. But then if through Pentecostalism, if you moved over to the labor, which the, even the early church people had to go through that process, and they wouldn't have put, they wouldn't have gained any further than that 30, 60. But if they, if they were able to continue on and finish their course to get 100 percent, to get in, to get in the the fullness of God. I, uh, I could, you know, I'll tell you something I've been doing lately. Lately, I have really, this has really been hard on me because I've been. I've been revisiting why I can't see that you 
that we have a restored church or that you can make the bride before we have a restored church. But I've really put that on the altar and said, God, if I'm wrong about that, I want to know it. But I could give you several reasons why, I'm, why I need answers. You know, um, you know, there's, there is several reasons. There's several scriptures that I have that are, I can't get over them. I can't get past them. I mean, I'd, it'd be a wonderful thing if you could just say, uh, I listened to Brother uh, DeSino's message you sent me, Brother uh, Painter. You don't? Well, it, it must have came to you and several other people. I don't know who sent it, but it was a good message. It, he's he's got a uh, he's got a gift where he he can he takes almost all of the word of God. He's he's a good pastor because he 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 turns everything that that I've heard him talk about just about into everyday walk with God, which is just what you need as a Christian. Uh, he was teaching on Zechariah four. I, he never did tell what it applied to. As far as the two witnesses, I know he knows that, but that's not, you know, he was trying to get it down to where, what this oil and these lamps will do for you, you know, what it actually, and, and I thought it was good. I thought he did a good job. He, uh, you know, he wakes up in the morning, takes his coffee, and he's about half asleep when he starts out, it seems like, you know, he's, he's <clears throat> hawking around and getting him some coffee and all and getting going, but he, he, you know, it's a good, yeah, I think what he does is good. Um, anyway, um, I was going to give you this scripture in here on this word tribulation. When you have no root in himself, or, uh, but endureth for a while for when tribulation or persecution. All right, I'm going to look at that word tribulation. Here, it's the Greek word 2347. It means afflicted anguished, burdened, persecution, tribulation, and trouble. It was translated tribulation 21 times, affliction 17 times in the King James Version, trouble three times, anguish once, persecution once, and burdened once. Okay, so, and it means, and then there is, somebody give me, let's see, there's a scripture, I believe, talks about much tribulation. Let's see if we can get that. Let's see if I can give you that in Acts 14. Yes, in Acts 14, the 21st verse says, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. You say, well, Brother Smith, why are you bringing that up? Well, i got a scripture I want to give you. <laughs> in the seventh chapter of Revelation, Seventh chapter of Revelations. Those souls that were under the altar, the, no, the souls that washed their robes and made them white, in the 14th verse, I believe it is. Oops. 7 14. Yes. And he said unto the, him, Sir, said, Who's these people, these white robes? Said, Sir, you know. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. When Brother Elias asked me the question. He said, are these people that come out of the, you know, that, that suffered the vials that were poured out? I said, no, this is talking about the new earth. See, because the seventh chapter is talking about the 144,000 bride members that's made up down here. And I know... The old teaching, what it was, is taught, they, they used to think that was Jews, 144,000 Jews. But it don't fit the context of what's being said. What's being said is there's 144,000 of the bride that's made up down here, and then there's a, a number that no man can number, which we've always said that Matthew, uh, Abraham's vision was 
God showed him the stars of the stars of heaven. And then he, he said, your seed are going to be as the stars of heaven and the sand and as the sand of the sea. We've always taught that was the bride, the stars of heaven, and the sand of the sea was the new earth. Now you can, even though there's a lot of them, you can number the stars, but you can't number the sand of the sea. Them little grains of sand that's all the way around the whole ever ocean and the whole wide world. We've always used that as a number that no man could number. And they washed their robes and made them white, but they came out of great tribulation. Um, it, it, if you look up that word great, it means very wide, exceedingly, high, large, strong, much. So I'm coupling that with that scripture in, in Acts 14 to show that we with much tribulation, those people came out of much tribulation. Some of them came through Armageddon. Some of them lived through Armageddon. Some of them were there when the vials were poured out. Some of them lived through that. Some of them went all the way down. And remember, they're going to be ruled with a rod of iron. I mean, God is not going to play games down through a thousand years. It's going to be a restored church and judgment's going to be met because people are going to see, they're going to see, they're not going to have to restore the church. It's going to be restored and they're going to see the full manifestation of God and they're either going to heed to it or they're going to suffer some pretty severe judgment. And many of them are going to be judged eternally. Isaiah said that if they die at a hundred years old, they'll be accursed. So... Many people are going to be way above 100 years old. But some of them will have to go through some correction, you know, uh, some pretty severe correction or go through much trials or much tribulation or much affliction, much persecution, because I'm sure there is going to be people rise up down through the thousand years when God begins to go into these different countries that's never even heard the name of Jesus. So it's not going to be, you know, just everything rolling smooth down through the thousand years. So anyway, I'm just using that word tribulation because, you know, Brother, Brother Elias was, you know, trying to figure out what great, great tribulation they went through. Well, I just showed him in Acts 14 that there was much tribulation that we all have to go through to overcome sin. You're going to have to go through a lot of tribulation, a lot of trials, a lot of... A lot of a persecution, a lot of affliction. Get the rocky ground out of your life. Get the get the thorns and thistles out. You know that's trials to the flesh. Mortify therefore the deeds of the flesh through the spirit. You can't tell me that mortifying your flesh is not tribulation. <laughs> it is. It's not easy to kill the flesh out. The old man just won't hardly die. Anyway. God bless your hearts. We'll, we'll go upstairs, take a break, and uh, have service. It's good to have Brother and Sister Durham home, isn't it? Yes. Praise God, we missed them. Yeah. We'll never do that again. No. <laughs> no, we won't. We hope not. You never know what will happen in this life, but... Anyway, all right, yes. <clears throat> 